Okay, um, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, we're gonna get started here. So uh, let's, without further ado, um, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, so we are going to record this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat feature of GoToWebinar. Uh, we will, a lot of this is a discussion. So if you will, we'll try to talk and address your questions during it. And uh, you can use the hashtag remote IT channel after this webinar to continue the conversation um, in better IT. And I'm gonna turn on a webcam so you can see who I am. There I am. And here we are. Uh, so I'm Brian Farrell. I'm an IT manager for Better Cloud. Uh, I've been with Better Cloud for about two, almost two years now. And uh, I handle internal IT operations. So the support that we provide to our employees. Um, and as such, I'm a big user of our own product. And with me is Blair Sammons. Hey all, I'm Blair. Uh, I just started Better Cloud. Oh almost six months ago now uh, in a previous life. So now I'm a solution engineer. So I'm part of the, the sales team and help uh, you know prospects look at better cloud, run POCs, make sure it's an actual good fit in their environment, all those fun, thing, fun things. Um, however, in a previous life, previously to this, I also was in IT. So I spent the last 15 years or so going in and out from in-house MSP consultant, uh, started out at the Apple store, like so many uh, other people. Oh and, yeah, uh, eventually same. became. Same. Hey, uh, eventually IT director and managed the, you know, the whole IT team for a large organization. And now here I am on the other side of the fence. <laughs> now here we are, famous at last. Here we are. Oh my gosh. All right, you want to dive in? Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so we kind of, this is going to be a lot more informal than some of our other webinars. A lot more, like Brian said, discussionary and, and kind of just like, how are we feeling? Where are we at? What what is gonna what does this look like <laughs> since we're all trying to figure this all out so some of the topics just kind of at a high level we, we want to touch on uh first off is the the SaaS off skill set and kind of this digital transformation that covid and coronavirus have brought to us and um kind of the more the upside of that and what that looks like for us as it practitioners um going forward um next is going to be again a little bit more high level look at our infrastructure and our files and how are we enabling our users? How are we ensuring that they have what they need to do while they're at home, but also all of our stuff's locked down. We're not just leaking data out, um, all those fun little topics that are super, uh, if it was easy to solve, we wouldn't have jobs. Um, then we're gonna go back into kind of some of the data behind how long is this gonna last? What is this gonna look like a little bit more long-term? Um, how can we, as a, you know, as IT practitioners, brace ourselves, embrace our end users, and again, enable our end users for the long haul? And then, like the, that last point there, we really want you guys to give us some feedback during this whole this whole uh, webinar. So definitely blast questions in the chat, uh, bring topics up. If we start talking about something that is relevant to you or whatever, uh, feel free to jump in and kind of join the conversation, um, because none of us are as strong as all of us. <laughs> Did I forget anything, Brian? Anything you wanted to cover today? No, I think that's it. Um, so, SaaS up skill set through the digital transformation. It sounds very impressive. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, do you want to you want to talk about this here? Yeah, it's something that's kind of struck out to me. So, I'm a super active user of LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn, um, and so because of that, I get these alerts for these SaaS ops style roles that are popping up and you know, these are three that i personally had notified on my own dashboard of specific to SaaS ops roles that are opening up and we're seeing a huge flux of this right and, and they're literally calling out like spotify SaaS ops engineer slack enterprise service manager at disney i mean these are the companies that are that need help in this field in this world in this we've now sent everyone home they still need to do their jobs how do we do that <laughs> yeah and these and these jobs started popping up prior to this pandemic too like this was already a trend that was starting to on the to go on the rise and i think what we've observed is that the the pandemic has really accelerated that because you know we're, we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more but the the companies that are able to uh use these SaaS applications and 
administer them and secure them at the best are going to be the companies that can make this transition a lot more nimbly. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but the whole buy versus build model is good, right? We're all experiencing that with SaaS, but it's not its not just a, oh, I buy it and thus everything's solved and it's all great and everything's hunky-dory right. and the support team from fill in the blank SaaS company is just gonna do it all for me and that we're done. Like, well, have you seen the Google best practices list they sent? It's like <laughs> 200 plus steps, right? That you have to do, Mr. Customer. Somebody's gotta do that. And the demand, yeah, we can see on the, the three over there on the right, like the demand for these SaaS apps is ridiculous. I think we have a couple slides. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Like the increase in usage in some of these apps is ridiculous. Somebody's got to go through and manage this stuff. This stuff's not going to solve itself, right? I love this. A 30x growth in meets in the US in just yeah, the week crazy. of March 15th to the 21st. Like that's bananas versus oh that's the entire average for q4 that's nuts i love how they included house party too as if like yeah, no, that's my favorite part that's is like <laughs> we're we're both improving collaboration at work and uh, also we're connecting with our friends it's great and then like that's also insane. as if house party is like a like a great business SaaS app i think we should start using it here also only 8x for house app or house party in the us but france they love themselves some house party. Really do. Um, and then the next slide idea. I think shows. Yeah, right. Uh, next slide shows our in, just internal usage. How have you seen as you know front lines on this? Because we were already obviously fairly SaaS forward to begin with, but clearly uh, has significantly increased. How are you experiencing it, Mr. IT? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's it's. Um, funny because I I wouldn't have really expected such a huge spike because I so many of our meetings already use video conferencing to some one degree or another. I mean, we have multiple offices and nearly every meeting has some kind of video conference thing attached to it, but we, we have actually noticed like quite a big spike as you can see. Um, so we use both Zoom and Google Meet uh, internally. And so Meet, I mean, that was the, the really the standard for us for a long time. And Meet has almost doubled in or, or has doubled in uh, usage uh, going into March. And then Zoom is also, I mean, Zoom is, they're Zooming, they're taking off. I mean, this is a trend that's reflected in the rest of um, uh, the workforce. But like, for, you know, January, I'm sure December is kind of a slow month, but then February, it started to take off. And then March and April, I mean, we've, we've more than doubled uh, the number of meetings we've had over Zoom within the past, within these two months. And, a, and April's figure, this is for the middle of April. It's not even, it was, I think I took the screenshot before the middle, April 14th. Well, there we go, exactly the middle of April. And we've already exceeded the usage of Zoom from the entire month of March. It's really kind of crazy. Yeah, it's crazy and, too, like the amount of internal meetings that have increased. And this is across the board, right? I'm talking to prospects all day and everyone's feeling it like, well, I only would have 10 hours a week of meetings before. And now it's like 25 hours of meetings now. I feel like I'm in more yeah. meetings than I was before. Like, well, this is part of that new normal, right? Yeah, I mean, it's the same with me. I feel like there's so much, I don't know. I guess I'm just realizing now how many sort of like drive-by conversations there were. It's like very casual things that now become meetings. Um, and then the next slide here, uh, what I was curious about was we actually have, um, we've also seen an uptick in overall workflow actions in, in Better Cloud in our own product uh, across the board. So this is a this is a rough chart for all um, Better Cloud users, and. This is not Obviously, just there's an, like the internal better cloud, like what we've done for ourselves. This is everything, everyone touching better cloud. Yeah, exactly. So across the board, there has been a, about a 30% increase um, since the since this started. Now you can see that there was also an increase from December to January. And part of that can be explained really that like you don't, most companies don't do a lot of automated workflow things in the month of December. Um, but we've already had a huge uptick and this is, more unusual, um, you know, February to March to April, then, uh, you know, this is not a normal trend. This is normally it would be a little bit flatter than this. So um, a lot of these actions 
are things like assigning licenses to people. So, I mean, for us, we started using, we, we use Zoom already, but we started using it a lot more um, when this pandemic started and not everybody had Zoom licenses. Uh, and so we had to quickly assign those licenses to the groups of employees that needed them um, very quickly. And that's an example of, I mean, a, I think a very common type of workflow action across the board. Yeah, the, an interesting one, and we're following the, you know, this webinar up on uh, Thursday with the uh, furloughing and offboarding workflows mm -hmm. and like, okay, well, my employees aren't gone, but they're also not here. What does that look like? Um, yeah, I love this, this tweet from, from Aaron. So, you know, we're talking about that SaaS off skill set and, you know, he kind of has some skin in the game for SaaS being the CEO of Box, but um, right, it's like it's a little of the yeah. SaaS is the future, <laughs> says the says the CEO of a SaaS company, but I think he's right, right? Yeah, he you know, that doesn't make him about, wrong. Yeah, I mean, all of these things. It's not like these only started now, but we've be, be, it, it's really accelerated the transition, and uh, it's really jumped this like chasm. I mean, there's really, I don't think there's any going back right now. I mean, companies that going through this, any company that's sitting and has things on-prem, okay, they're discovering it's harder to provide access to those resources. They're talking about trusted devices. Well, now um, people, a lot of people are forced to use their personal computers or their personal phones to access data. Um, I mean, I have a laptop, but not everybody does, right? And maybe people didn't even get the chance to take it home. Um, protecting the perimeter, well, there literally is no perimeter right now. I mean, you've got people VPNing into the office, um, but that is not necessarily a sustainable thing to have your entire company VPNing into the office for, you know, upwards of six months. Um, and then, you know, I think you've, I'm sure you've noticed like monolithic tools transitioning to best of breed apps has been a thing for a long time now. I mean, with that and you well, it's interesting, like, like on that point, like, the the whole best of read concept is no longer just like a marketing buzzword right it's like actually no yeah. no, no we're specifically going to go find a best of breed app here's our definition of best of breed like oh no this is this is a thing like we're we're experiencing this right now yeah and and that's and part of that best of breed um uh philosophy is you user experience i mean i get like personally like my my choice of how to how to choose applications is like I look at the website and I'm I'm like it, are there screenshots um, can I use the demo does it make sense when I read it or is it just sort of um, or is it just all text is there is it all buzzwords is it like you know I mean user experience the the, the end users are the people who are using these tools and they care and. In IT, it's the same thing. I mean, I, a lot of enterprise applications used to be really tough to use, and now they're getting easier and easier every day. I mean, configuring Slack, right? That's it's it's a it's a couple of different screens of options, and it, everything is really clearly laid out when you're configuring it. Now, the challenge, right, is that it's really easy to configure one application, but now you have 80, 50, 100. You know how well, yeah, now Karen and HR are spinning up her own version, and then you know <laughs> Susie and marketing has her own version, and now it's like, okay, well, I'm not controlling either of those. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then you know, in terms of uh, well, and then employees to extended enterprise. I mean, it's not just employees accessing your your space anymore. Um, I mean, we have contractors. I remember the first time have... I joined a Slack channel that had like an external member in it, and it like blew my mind. Like, wait, where else do they have access? How are they seeing, like, what's going on? Like, I, you know, whatever. And like, no, that's normal now. Like now it is totally standard to have multiple guest channels, like not a big thing. But like when that first rolled out, it was super, like it felt super invasive and like crazy. Right, it like feels wrong at first. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, I mean, we, I mean, we had the, we had discussions about that before we, we set up um, our first shared channel. Like, okay, well, how do, how do we know what's being shared here? And how do we know like who on their side has access to this and like what happens when they leave and like a lot of important questions to ask. Um, but now it's like, it's so commonplace. That it's like, okay, so so-and-so wants to, um, you know, spin up another uh, shared channel with us. Great, cool, here we go. Seriously, um, uh, Robin asked a question. Do you want to go back to the previous slide real fast? Oh yeah, the sure. Workflow slide. 
Yeah. Uh, so Robin asks, what is the increase in workflow attributed to how is a workflow being used? So these are workflows within the Better Cloud product. Our workflows are how we automate things, right? You have a when trigger, you have an if condition if you need it, and then a bunch of action API style calls against all of your various platforms. So that could be onboarding, offboarding, mid-user lifecycle management, right? Group permissions, uh, security policy violations. Is something being shared externally? Is there a social security number in a document that should be shared? You know, those types of things. Um, and all of those will then eat, kick off a workflow. And we are tracking how many workflows that we want. You can also run workflows manually and manually kick them off, you know, grant user permissions to these shares and just list them all out or whatever the particular use case happens to be. Um, so this increase is a 30% increase in the overall automation we're seeing happen within our product. Hopefully that answers that question, Raman. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, we're talking about best of breed apps. Um, along with the, the tool, the, the skill set of being able to manage these SaaS apps, you also have to have the, the apps themselves, the tools to get the job done. Um, so this is kind of a little, like, I don't get to talk about how we run IT internally all the time here. Um, so I like to kind of do a behind the scenes um, Wizard of Oz style. Um, you know, when you are, you have to have the right tools. And so it means choosing best of breed apps and you have to, you, you have to hit, you use these apps to hit the, the, the buckets of stuff that you need to take care of. Um, these are obviously not the only applications that you can use. These are the apps that we use, um, but you know, uh, productivity, G Suite, it could easily be Office 365. Identity, it, it could easily be One Login or Azure or Google. Um, you know, there's plenty of, there's endless number of project management tools out there, right? And ticketing platforms and MDM and, and EMM tools, um, although everyone should use Jamf, but I digress. Um, and then, you know, to complement that as well, better cloud. Um, you know, wink, wink, we use our own product. Well, and you know, to add, like this is what ten like apps out of the hundred and sixty that we have, right? Like this is the big ones. This is the ones that are you know you could, could consider like birthright, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're an intern, chances are you're gonna need access to each of these systems and a laptop to just like turn on, right? But you know, I'm yeah. thinking like in pro productivity, there's Lattice and Lessonly and uh, like and 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 right there's like a million mm -hmm. systems we have access to you know we we're we're responsible for the core ones but we're also responsible for all those other ones right right i think yeah i mean That's we have it gets crazy yeah we have at least 160 or so other SaaS applications we use um some of them you know it's it's one or two people but some of them are are you know it's not everybody but it's a significant number of people it's either an entire team or an entire department um and and it's one thing to manage access to this stuff uh because a lot of it is you know, it's everybody's getting slack everybody's getting g suite um it's fairly straightforward but then when you get into those more granular apps controlling access to those apps making sure that those users have not just access to the app, but the right permissions within the app. And that in the app, they have access to the right set of documents or, or assets or files or whatever. Um, and that that access is appropriately changed if their role changes or if they leave the company. Um, that's where it gets to be real spicy. You know, License reclamation, right? Like I'm yeah. thinking of something like Salesforce where you're spending out the butt for that license. You want that money back as fast as humanly possible. Yeah, and especially now, I mean, it's people are companies are tightening the purse strings quite a bit, and so getting new licenses is getting a lot harder. I mean, it, it maybe it was a fairly simple process to acquire more licenses because you had budgeted for it or whatever, or you needed a new tool before, and it was a quick approval. And now it's like, okay, I need two more licenses of. Uh, you know, Zoom, I need to submit a finance approval to get, and that has to go through a whole review process to make sure that I can even get those two licenses. So it's even more and more important to make sure that you're you're reclaiming the ones that you're not using. Love that. Um, okay, so to round out the, the SaaS ops skill set, this is a slide that uh, a lot of you, if you've been on one of our webinars before, have seen. Um, this is how Better Cloud is kind of defining and looking at SaaS ops. And I wanted to call this out for a couple of reasons because it makes sense when we talk about the product, right? We 
have designed better cloud in a way to solve these sets of problems and not really the other way around if we have a product and we're trying to look problems for it to solve um so status ops is broken into three buckets so we've got the discovery piece right that's discovering shadow it how can we reclaim licenses um who's using what the kind of data we just ran through Obviously, the SaaS management was, which is where most of us spent. Uh, most of us IT people are going to live, right? The actual managing of these platforms, uh, making sure that they're set up correctly, running those audits that we need to run for compliance and whatnot. Uh, that bleeds directly into security, which is again where we spend a good chunk of our time, uh, locking down those files, making sure we're not sharing stuff publicly, fixing stuff that is shared publicly, and then finally that bottom is really how this is then being played out in the workforce. Like we showed in that first slide, right? Role titles are actually being called SaaS ops now. Um, the world of SaaS has grown to the point that there needs to be people skilled in this area of expertise in order to be able to manage this stuff for people, for businesses, individuals, so on and so forth. I miss anything here, Brian. Does this ring true for how you see, I mean, your job for the most part? Yeah, absolutely. And it's also becoming, I think, less and less siloed in IT. I mean, it used to be that you might, because um, applications were so monolithic or because it was such a like complex thing, you might have had a really specialized task before. Like you are the person who administers Active Directory, or maybe you're one of like 10 people who administer Active Directory. Um, and you really had to, you could only have time to focus on that one thing. But the reality of today's IT environment is that that's not really doable in most cases anymore. Um, most companies have fairly lean IT teams. Those teams have to do a lot more with less. And so they're, they're you know, IT people are dipping into the security side of things. They're making sure that, that data isn't being lost, that um, sensitive data isn't being shared with people, that if in the event of an incident that they can, they have a plan set up to respond properly. Um, and they're also in to the discovery and like, and as you mentioned, the discovery and, and spend management and who's actually using the platform. And it's it's becoming a much more, I think, holistic, you know, individuals have a much more holistic role in IT now uh, than they may have had, you know, 10 whatever years ago. So I think it's, yeah, it's it's important. And um, we have a poll. It's interesting to see it all broken out like that, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, we're going to ask a quick poll question, get some uh, engagement from all y'alls. Um, so uh, you'll see this pop up here shortly. I think I just sent it out. Yep. Boom. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So this real just informal, want to get some info and insight from you guys on, on how you're seeing your SaaS stack increase, not increase, license count, um, so on and so forth. So if you could take two seconds and fill that out for us, that'd be amazing. And we'll wait about a, maybe another 30, 45 seconds. Oh man, seeing results come in live is strange. Yes, this is fun. Have you seen okay. the amazing videos that have posted from all the teachers trying to utilize these platforms for teaching lately? <laughs> like the chaos that you see. They're they're amazing and like horrifying too at times. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll go ahead and close off this poll. Anyone else? Last time, last chance? Nope. Great. All right. So it looks like 30, zero. There we have 0% have bought new SaaS apps since everything kicked off. Share the results here. Yeah, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty amazing. I mean, that's telling me that everyone on the call here was already fairly best of breed before everything kicked off. Yeah, and then we and then um, below, you know, and then it's we we bought new SaaS and added additional licenses. So I think it's it's this could be, um, we, I, I think some people are. It's not just that people are buying new programs or new applications, but we're also expanding the seats for the existing applications that we have. Yeah, the vast majority either bought a new app and licenses or just bought new licenses, and that is you know the new license piece especially. To be expected. I mean, we, we did it too. Like everyone's having to increase their usage. Um, and yeah, finally, I mean, we know we have not bought anything new. 
again, I think that brings up that first point of like everyone on the call, all you know, 35 of us started like entered into this crisis SaaS heavy to begin with. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if you're not buying anything new right now, then and you're not buying any more licenses, that means all your people were already enabled to work from home. Like, kudos to you. Like, you were the lucky one to escape the onslaught of tickets that opened up when all this kicked off. And I think you know, to an earlier point um, about how companies are are handling this, I think IT is probably a little less. I would I would venture to say that IT is probably a little less affected as an industry than a lot of other industries that are more regulated or more on prem in this case. So probably a lot of the people watching are um, fairly tech forward company with tech forward companies too. You've so seen, uh, I know you've seen it because we've talked about it, but that list from Candor, and again, we'll talk about this on Thursday with the offboarding about like all the hiring freezes and whatnot, and then they break out that data. And IT is, you know, one of the lower numbers of freezes and layoffs simply because of exactly everything we're talking about right now. Like we're all the ones that people need to do this. <laughs> right. Uh, all right, well, that's a, that's so, a good uh, segue, I think from our skill set and how necessary all of us are into a little bit more granular of, of how we're doing this. Um, so let's let's just talk a little bit. Let's go to that next slide. Um, how are we ensuring our users have access? What reports are we running? And then kind of a little bit higher level, like how are we enabling them from working from home, right? I can't go and restart your modem. Um, I, I, I can't make sure that your DNS is set up correctly. Like I can't do those things. So how are we crossing that bridge? Um, and where's the, where's the line of like enabling working from home versus being personal tech support <laughs> when you can't zoom oh, yeah. grandma? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fine, it's a fine line. I mean, it's, um, it's on that it's, first, it's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, um, it's, you know, <laughs> we could, we could talk about this a little bit more, but the, there's, you know, it's like, I, I need to make sure that you can do your work. And so if you can't connect to the internet, that's obviously stopping you from doing your work. Um, I need to help you get to the part that I can help you, but it, basically I have to leave off where, you know, Comcast or, or your, your ISP pick up, right? I can't, I'm not going to call Comcast on your behalf, unfortunately. I've seen some, you know, like our sysadmin posts or the Better IT Slack channel where companies are buying like cheaper, but still buying configurable routers for people and saying, okay, look, you know, you've got DHCP coming in from your ISP. Here's the, here's the router. I can remote into this, whether it's you know, Meraki or Unifier or whatever. I can remote in this and help you like go be, go home and take this with you. Like that yeah. was easier for them to deal with than trying to walk users through how to configure their router or what happened, printer or whatever. I think I would rather go with that approach to myself. Wait, you have an unlimited budget, right? <laughs> of course, yeah. I mean, I would rather go with that. Uh, of course, I can't really buy all of these things at the moment um, without, you know, very uh, a strong justification. Yeah, and uh, I love, I love this because it's all sold out. Yeah, I love this in this graph here. The the you know the things that are driving IT tickets are things like hardware or Wi-Fi or reset passwords, um, video conferencing, all that. And then router reprogramming is tiny. And I'm gonna say that that's probably not because people aren't um, uh, asking for that. And it's more like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be doing that necessarily. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, I've had to walk through, right, like even little things that you wouldn't think would be an issue before, like, but why is my Xbox like not connecting? Oh, well, you know, you, did you turn on UPNS and did you enable port forwarding? Like what the hell is port forwarding? I don't know how to do any of this stuff. Like, okay, well, <laughs> we all work from home in the same internet now. Like we got to figure this stuff out. Uh, how are you yeah. dealing with it, Brian? Mr. IT, are you guys seeing a, an influx in tickets like these? We, we've we definitely had, I would say, um, like a moderate uptick in, in ticket creation. Um, we, it's it's really not been as bad as I think I've seen with some other companies and with some other industries. I, I do attribute that to the fact that we're a tech company. A lot of the people that work here are pretty tech savvy. Um, they're typically able to solve a lot of issues on their own. I also think that they all tend to value pretty fast 
internet connections, right? So they're not like trying to make, um, you know, VoIP and video conferencing work over like an eight meg down connection. Uh, we have had, um, we've had some hardware tickets. Uh, that's been maybe a big, bigger logistical challenge in terms of both um, troubleshooting things for employees who are having hardware issues and for onboarding new employees and coordinating the logistics of getting all that hardware shipped out. And then when you do that and then something goes wrong, uh, getting that back, sending it back out. Um, it, it really, that's, that's, it's a small amount of tickets, but it has been quite a big increase of the time spent doing those things. Have you guys had to change any processes or workflows or whatever to enable more browser-based work, right? Where people are maybe, again, kind of like to what Aaron was saying earlier, you know, we're not necessarily authenticating a device, we're authenticating a user. They can, as long as they can get to a browser, they can get to these SaaS apps, right? Have you guys had you know, to change anything or adapt anything to enable that? We've had to find some creative solutions for things. So there are some um, there are some production applications uh, that or production systems that we require uh, device authentication to access. And so if you're using the Better Cloud laptop that you have, uh, it's all good. And then most of the times that's that's been fine. And we can remotely manage that. We can also check to make sure that the computer that is that's accessing those resources um, has endpoint protection on it, has uh, file encryption or disk encryption, um, has a strong password set, is up to date with the latest patches, whether it's Mac OS or Windows. Um, so even when I would say we users maybe uh, if they're trying to use their personal device and it's and it's needed for some reason, there's been some instances where people have just been without their computer because uh, it it broke and we have to ship them a replacement, but they still need to get work done. I think in most cases, they've already been fairly well enabled to make sure, make that work. I mean, we've had to do some like creative solutions with virtual machines and installing, walking people through installing VPN setups remotely and some things like that, but nothing we can handle. Uh, Sean in the chat brings up, uh, we've had employees self-isolate in the middle of the Wisconsin Northern Woods. Makes our job so much easier, right? Uh, I'm not envious of you if that's what you're asking. <laughs> the rural internet in America is no joke. That is a beast that I do not want to tackle. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I haven't heard too much from any of my colleagues in rural areas, and that could either be because we don't have a ton of them there, or they're not having problems, or it's just because they just don't have internet anymore, and they're they just haven't been you able to hear reach out because they can't connect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's no joke. Um, let's jump to the next slide real fast. This is from our uh, State of Insider Threats uh, in the Digital Workplace ebook that we launched a little while ago. But specifically, all these uh, pain points here are in regards to insider threats. And that doesn't have to be malicious, right? That could just be, you know, Karen in HR needs some sort of document to print, but she can't get it on her, you know, her home printer to work on her work laptop. So she shares the doc with her personal Gmail account, jumps to her personal account and doesn't realize in that jump, she opened the file up to everybody, right? Or, you know, some weird situation like that, which is very real right now, right? The, the non-nefarious intrusions into our systems, or at least the gateway or the vectors of those attacks are astronomically higher because now I don't have any control over what network people are connecting to. In a lot of cases, even the device I don't have control over, they're using some personal whatever, right? Mm -hmm. How are we going through and remediating that? How are we going through and making sure our stuff's not just sieving out? Um, obviously, this is a, a toot of our own horn, um, but Brian, how do you solve for these? Well, Blair, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so we, I mean, we, <laughs> are very much users of our own product. Um, part of the, you know, I think we rely a lot on alerting uh, for this type of stuff. So we have quite a few alerts set up for um, either publicly sharing files uh, with links or publicly sharing files uh, outside the domain, um, files that have certain types of content in them. So we do content scanning to make sure that 
users' um, personal ident personally identifiable information, PII stuff, isn't being shared accidentally, or credit card numbers aren't being shared accidentally, or credit card numbers aren't being stored internally in any sort of doc that someone has access to. Um, we, we have alerts for things like email forwarding, um, making sure that it, the stuff isn't just being forwarded to like a Gmail account so that um, because somebody, you know, had trouble getting into their email. Uh, we, I mean, we have not only those alerts set up, but we also have quite a few uh, remediation steps for it. So um, we have alerts that post directly into Slack that our team can take immediate action on. So we have a joint IT security team. We collaborate all the time on it. We're in the Slack channel. And we'll, if we see something that looks a little suspicious, we'll reach out to the user and say, hey, did you mean to share this, um, this revenue doc uh, publicly um, to, with anyone with the link? Or um, if it's something where um, we know based on scanning that it contains uh, sensitive content and there's a high degree of confidence in that, we'll actually revert the sharing settings. And then if somebody really needs to, to share it, we can reach out to them and discuss what needs to happen. But we take care of the, 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 the potential threat before it can become a real threat. It's one of the things again tooting our own our own horn here but one of the things i love about EverCloud is the the various levels of remediation you can set up right i'm thinking of something like cloud lock where it is fire and brimstone and that's like that's all you get right we're scorching the earth to make sure everything's protected which might be necessary but if it's some low level pii you know in better cloud you could do something like okay let's wait a couple hours and then email the user and say hey did you mean to do this right instead of just straight locking it right out of the gate um, right. I know for me, when I brought better God into my environment, that was key. I had to be able to do that. Ooh, a C-level sent it out? Okay, I'm going to make sure that it's handled a little differently. So I'm going to set up a different type of workflow for that than, you know, my regular, whatever the particular use case happens to be. Um, I love yeah, that. I mean, context, context is king in these situations. I mean, it's it's really important to know not just like what's being shared and with whom, but who's doing the sharing and uh, what what type of documents do they normally share and is that something that would should be triggering alarm? Um, one other nice thing I think that we do is, or I should say it's a nice thing that most, many, it's, it seems to be a trend, many, many um, SaaS providers, um, whether it's Google or whether it's Okta, are starting to offer more and more sort of contextual access awareness. So they start to give you a lot more device intelligence about what's accessing your resources. So Google, you can say, Anyone that accesses a drive file, um, you can find out whether that was a device that's owned by you or whether it's a device that's um, being used, uh, that's a personal device um, or a cell phone or something like that. So that's another, um, that's another complimentary thing. Um, I noticed too, there's a couple of questions. Um, uh, oh, just to jump back to a previous uh, point that we were talking about, about um, resources and working remotely, um, how we handle user requests to get corporate owned equipment. So uh, in the first stages, um, before we had shelter in place uh, orders at our two offices or our three offices, we let some employees go back in and get their monitors or their mice or equipment um, on a one-off basis. And then since the shelter in place, we've allowed people to um, order an expense up to like a certain amount um, for monitors, keyboards, mice, um, you know, ergonomic things, that type of stuff. My um, amount so, was sixty five hundred bucks. What was your amount, Brian? That's not true. <laughs> um, yeah, it was the same. Sure. Let me just <laughs> need to replace my chair really quick. Uh, <laughs> and then um, there's another question. Let's see. Um, oh, and actually, yeah, Mark brings up a better cloud. Too. Oh, oh I was just going to say, there's there's another one about not only. Um, not only about SaaS app shadow, sort of shadow IT, uh, not only are people using SaaS apps and using SaaS apps that you may not officially sanction or you may have set up on your own, but so many SaaS providers because of the pandemic are offering free trials or they're offering extended free trials. So it's something that you might not even discover because maybe you rely on somebody paying for something as, as your means of discovery. But now um, with this, yeah, it's a good point that, that a lot of people can sign up for trials that last now for two or three months and they can be using a product for three months before you ever discover that that they're using it because they didn't have to pay for it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, one more question that I'll touch on briefly before we show the next slide. Um, does Better Cloud have a solution to manage alerts more granularly in Slack, like directly to a user, post into an admin channel? Um, these are specifically to specific incidents, like public sharing of files, external domains, contains PII. Uh, yes, the short answer is yes. There's a couple different ways to slice that within the product, whether it's within automation workflow or if we get alerted immediately from ingestion of that particular alert. Um, so there are a couple different ways to do that. Yes. Speaking of that and how the platform works, uh, let's jump to the next slide, Brian. And we're not going to spend a ton of time here, but talking about that insider threat model and you know how do we protect users over the perimeter and, and whatnot. I love this slide. This is a fairly new slide that we're, uh, we're developing to show people kind of where Better Cloud fits in in that whole identity authorization governance, you know, automation lifecycle. You can see here, you know, we've got the user, we've got potentially a real time import of their user data, you know, probably for a lot of people, they're skipping that step completely and just living within their IDAS, SSO, IAM, whatever you want to call it, right? That then is provisioning users across the board, but then, then what, right? Like granting someone access is great, but now we need to go through and, and do what Better Cloud does, make sure that they have the right access. They're not giving access away to people that shouldn't have that access, um, that the stuff that they have access to isn't containing PII, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All right. We've got one more poll, one more poll question. This one should be a little bit easier for everybody. I'm going to send this now, maybe. There we go. Launching the poll now. How has your level of security concern been affected since moving to remote work? So three options, bigger concern, stay the same, less concern of security. I'm gonna to wanna to make sure to email the people that say security has become less of a concern and ask them, <laughs> how? <laughs> Please share your secrets. Yeah. Well, we stored all the sensitive files at the office and now no one can get to them. <laughs> All right, we'll give it like 10 more seconds here. Five, four, three, two, one. Closing the poll. Sharing the results. Hey, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Security has become a larger concern. Yep, that. Uh, <laughs> that sounds about right. I, we were talking leading up to this, uh, just how glad I am to not be a consultant right now. And I'm sure we have some people on the call right now that are just going crazy right now with all of the work uh, that this brings to the table, right? Your security is now top of mind. Security consultants are busy. There's some work to be done. And making up for lost time and security is not an easy thing to do. No, no, not at all. I'm curious though, the security has stayed about the same, the, or the concern around security has stayed about the same. I'm wondering of those people, like was the concern hair on fire before and now it's just, well, I was already on fire. So what, you know, what is this? Or, you know, is that more, no, I think about security first and then I think about other things. So that, you know, process hasn't changed. That's a good question. I think a lot of, yeah. I mean, a lot of, um, a lot of companies that have, are, are you know, pretty SaaS forward or cloud forward. Um, I mean, it's becoming more and more common now that security and IT teams work together. So I would say that there's at least a good chunk of these, uh, these, this result that probably is, you know, we were doing good security things prior to this, and and so security best practices like defense in depth and, and securing endpoints and securing and having DLP. And um, if you were doing those things before, uh, it, it shouldn't matter too much that somebody's not sitting in your office. So that could be some explanation for it. Yeah. I'm very glad that nobody said security has become less of a concern. That makes me happy. <laughs> I would, All right, let's move to I the next definitely. section here. That kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, last section. So is this a new now? Are we just dealing with this for the next couple months? Uh, is this the new normal? Are we, have we changed the definition of normal? Um, obviously, I don't think you and I have the answer to this, but I think it's worth looking into and, and kind of talking about a little bit. Um, yeah. Let's jump to the next slide real fast. 
I love this first meme or the first tweet. Like, who led digital transformation of your company? The CEO, the CTO, COVID nineteen. It, it's so true. COVID nineteen all the time. It's like that other meme of uh, the security budget before a breach and the security budget after a breach. And it's like, yeah, it, it's true. I mean, we're we're living it. Um, I mean, those unfortunately, all that humans, haven't read. Yeah, you know, it's seriously. it's it's like we we understand uh, theoretically that something bad can happen and that we should be prepared for it. But unfortunately, it usually takes the bad thing happening for change to happen. Um, that next image on the right, if you haven't read David Pleas, our CEO's uh, blog post, LinkedIn post of kind of what the future of work looks like, and he goes into way more depth of this idea and kind of what we've been seeing with SaaS and what that looks like going forward. Um, highly recommend it. It's a great, great read. Um, but it goes into what we're about to talk about here in the, in the next couple slides. Yeah. Um, and then this is also uh, some, some screenshots from Reddit uh, that I found in the system and posts or the system and subreddit. And there's kind of two uh, interesting parallels here or, or point counterpoint here. One is um, sort of the shocked uh, admin who actually had coincidentally, I guess, um, maybe a year or two ago, made a huge push to move and to replace all of their equipment with uh, laptops and mobile friendly devices and had to really like, had to do a bunch of number crunching and, um, you know, nice friendly C-level bar graphs. And they finally got approval. And, you know, IT is kind of a thankless job some of the time or a lot of the time. Um, I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. But in this case, is he, he the, the entire post is about uh, he his C, CEO now coming back and saying, you know, if you hadn't done this, we would be screwed right now. So here's here's a raise and here's a bonus and here's all this stuff. And it's really kind of a shock. It's like the the opposite of what you normally expect. And then the one on the right is um, the, the this is my favorite thing is that like it's not until you have different circumstances that you see some weird workflow that a user was doing. Uh, that's just like, and in this case, it was, you know, people, he didn't realize that in order to merge PDFs rather than just using a tool to merge PDFs, uh, a user was printing out every document, scanning them back in as one thing, and then like emailing them to themselves. Uh, you know, it's stuff that you don't find until you're out of the office. I've seen that happen before too, live. It's just like, please oh, yeah. explain to me. I don't understand. I love this graph. It, so this yeah. is, I found this online and it is exactly to your last point. So this is from Vox. They did a bunch of looking into public companies that are adding working from home to their job postings. So again, public companies, everything's gotta be above board. Look at that jump. I mean, it was like single digits. And now yeah. their earnings calls transcripts or their whatever these transcripts are being pulled from, goodness goodness yeah that's that i mean if the if the big boys are moving in that in that direction it's it's going everywhere um yeah. okay this is another data point um i stole these from so borrow these use these from mckinsey the link will be in the description below mash that's like and subscribe button um so this is two different scenarios of of what recovery could look like according to the money right so this isn't necessarily health this isn't workloads this isn't working from this is just the money which we then can you know extrapolate how working from home is going to go and whatnot so on the left you can see that recovery is you know very quick everything bounces back when this goes away we're all back to normal fairly quickly you know so on and so forth on the right though is arguably the more realistic path of we're kind of we're we're in this for a bit like this is this is gonna this is gonna take a while um and what are we gonna do as IT folks to make sure that people are equipped to do their job remotely, right? Like security handbooks are gonna have to get completely rewritten. Processes on, Brian, to your point, the, the hardware repairs, like that's no longer is it gonna be the exception to the rule of sending out a replacement or whatever. That is going to become the normal and dealing with it in person might become the secondary, right? Like who knows, like we don't know yet. Right, this, this, this is one blew my mind. And and this is you know to the the previous point about um, uh, the changes that IT has made to make this shift possible. 
I mean, this is really the time for people, in, folks in IT to make the, keep making a difference. You know, this is, there's already a ton of recognition around IT's ability to enable the, the business to shift to remote work and how companies that have been able to do that will be more successful, will be more competitive. But if this is a trend that continues um, economically for, you know, through 2021, you're still going to be in that position to make those changes and to show the value that IT can bring to the company. Um, so this is, I mean, it's, it's a horrible situation, but this is, this is a real opportunity for uh, IT because this is a chance to be the hero. Yeah, and how do we fall and what can we do to equip ourselves to fall in the line of that first post, right? Of, oh, I'm getting recognition because people realize they cannot do their jobs without me. I mean, that wasn't any less true before, but people are feeling it now and seeing it now. And we're getting that exposure and that, you know, that face time that we might not necessarily have been getting shoved in some data center somewhere or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like, I don't want, want to go back into a data center. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. This graph on the right, though, like, I mean, that goes out. That's years. That's that's the normal has been changed, right? That the definition of what work looks like is fundamentally different in that scenario. And I think the combination of the trajectory that SaaS and kind of the workforce was taking, combined with this, I think you know, if we swapped out GDP for you know working from home usage and you know flip the graph, I think we're going to be looking at that graph on the right, going. If you know if that's an increase in work from home usage, that's probably going to stick, right? We're seeing a lot of. I saw a post on our side the other day, speaking of the red subreddit, um, where they were talking about the largest cost center for companies and like the the per you know work play or uh, um, workstation cost and how if you calculate facilities into that calculation and now you have the opportunity to remove facilities from that calculation. Okay, now how's your math adding up? It's like oh. Why would you ever calculate facilities into your per workstation, you know, algorithm or whatever? But now, if you have the opportunity to not have a facility or extremely limited facilities versus enabling work from home, that could have some major impact on your budget and opportunities to do other things and whatever. Yeah, I mean, you you have the ability to spend less on real estate, and it's tech. I mean, at least in the tech industry, obviously, there a lot of industries are based in other places, but tech is based in San Francisco or the Bay um, and New York right at least in the u.s those are the two most expensive cities in the country and you have yeah it's not like tech did any favors to yeah and it's not like they did any favors in atlanta or austin or denver where it used to be affordable to live like thanks to tech now those right. are pretty much the same <laughs> yeah and so you have a really like a win-win in, in some senses because uh you have the opportunity to reconsider what your strategy is for work from home and working remotely and maybe let go some of that some or all of that real estate that's as you said draining away your budget and maybe allowing you to do other things and then you also have the increased benefit of uh now a you know a, a thousand thousand percent increased pool of of candidates you know if you can only choose from the people that are within a commuting distance to the city that you're based in you're really excluding a lot of the talent in the rest of the country. And you know, the companies that are able, the, the companies that are willing to hire these people that may just not either want to or be able to live in a city or be able to commute or be in uh, you know, a slightly different, uh, you know, a different family circumstance, they're, they're gonna be the ones with a competitive advantage. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so to wrap uh, up kind of the section again, I got the slide in here of what we view SaaS ops as and kind of the definition of everything we just talked about. Okay, we're going to be doing this for a while. Um, and I wanted to bring this slide up again to kind of then piggyback that off into the next slide where we break that into our product and break it down to how we view each of these skill sets within SaaS ops and how Better Cloud the product solves for each of those. Uh, so for those of you on the call that haven't used Better Cloud before, um, this is why we exist and started from these pain points uh, and are going out of our way to solve for these pain points. So we hope to you know, partner with a lot more people through this and, and equip them to walk down their files, make sure their users are equipped to do their jobs, have a better understanding of what's going on in their environment and their um, SaaS stack to rein all that stuff in. 
Um, but it started with the pain points and I really like calling it out because you feel it when you <laughs> you use the product day in and day out. You definitely feel it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Brian, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I don't. Actually, uh, we had one question uh, here uh, that's uh, very fairly called us out, uh, that Los Angeles is also a tech hub. Uh, true, you know, um, Blair, I think you're you're in Los Angeles, aren't you? I just moved like a month ago to the beautiful state of Washington. It's a great time to move to the state of Washington, the epicenter for a viral disease. Let me just tell you. Great choice. I do recommend choices. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, LA's not doing too much better either. Um, no one's doing so, better, man. It, we're, we're all in this together. <laughs> Yeah, that's really true. And it's, you know, one thing that we, this is kind of as an aside, but, you know, a lot, I think it's an important difference to recognize too, is that there's a difference between people working remotely and people working from home, uh, people that want to do that and have been doing that. And what the current situation that we're in, which is not that, but rather there is a global pandemic and we have to be at home and also we're trying to do work. Um, and I think that's an important distinction to make. And so, you know, as you know, we are all in this together, you know, IT, right? Everybody, IT has the, 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 the responsibility, the, um, the power though, to, to really like help people get that work done easier without adding more stress to their lives. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so with that, we'd like to, to recommend a couple things. One, doing another one of these work or uh, work from home webinars, new normal webinars on Thursday, uh, specifically about um, offboarding. Uh, we're launching a new, or just launched today actually, a new feature within BetterCloud for workflow templates, um, kind of solving two pain points. The pain point of one, I don't know what to do <laughs> with all this automation, make it easier for me. And two, the other side of it uh, is, I have my standard offboarding punch list, let's say. Is that enough? Is that complete? Is Am I doing everything I should be doing in that? So we've developed these you know, best practice type templates and we're gonna show those to you on uh, Thursday. And then every Wednesday, we also have a weekly live demo in the platform where one of us solutions engineers uh, will dive into the platform and actually show it off. That tends to answer a ton of questions that people have as far as how it works, what it can do, what it looks like stuff like that, highly recommend jumping into those sessions. And then finally, um, as a current member, but also former member of uh, our um, community, I can attest both sides of the fence of both externally and internally, Better Cloud really, really cares about their people. Um, and do they, we do a really good job of reaching out, making sure that everyone's included, making sure that people are getting their questions answered um, in a very uh, helpful manner. So we have I don't remember what the number is, like 3,000 people on the Better IT Slack now. And like, yeah. I think it's like 80,000, 70,000 people signed up for the monitor. So there's a pretty beefy community out there. Um, highly recommend, I'm active in the Slack. So if you jump in there, you'll you'll see me jumping in there. Uh, not I'm part of my job, too. I just like being in the Slack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm active there too. And we have, we have all sorts of people from Better Cloud in there. We have product managers in Better IT. So if you wanna talk about the product, if you wanna talk about features, they're there. You can you can feel free to talk to them. Yeah, it's the real deal. All right, with that. Oh, look at that! Perfect timing and everything. It's like we planned it that way. I love it. Definitely love did. It. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining. Uh, hopefully, you know this conversation was valuable to you. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Hit us up on Slack. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys and girls. <laughs>